Hello, and welcome to another lovely session of Civil Engineering with Tanya J. Laird. I am the aforementioned Tanya J. Laird. This video is the 12th in our wood design series, and today we will be focusing on the topic of shrinkage in wood. We will be specifically looking at the shrinkage that occurs with changes in moisture content. Today's lovely music comes from the artist Julie Maxwell from her album Classic Piano Collection from the Princess of Mars. A link is included in the video description. As we discussed in the previous lecture, wood undergoes substantial changes in moisture content after it is harvested and as it is seasoned. It undergoes lesser changes in moisture content while in surface, assuming of course it is properly protected from the elements. Still, even in an interior conditioned space, some changes in moisture content will periodically occur, uh, if through seasonal variations, if nothing else. To properly consider the topic of moisture-related shrinkage in wood, we need to again consider the orthotropic nature of wood as a material. Recall that wood is what we refer to as an orthotropic material. Its properties vary with direction. This is in contrast to an isotropic material like steel, which exhibits the same properties in all directions. Additionally, wood shrinkage does not occur from all changes in moisture content. As long as wood is above the fiber saturation point and free water is still present, it will not undergo substantial shrinkage. Rather, shrinkage occurs at moisture content values below the fiber saturation point, where bound water is being driven off from the wood. In other words, shrinkage does not occur from water being driven from the capillaries between wood cells, but from the wood th cells themselves drying out and releasing water. And uh, now we get back to the orthotropic nature of wood. Wood shrinkage occurs differently in three different directions. First, it is negligible parallel to grain. Um, as the moisture content of a piece of lumber decreases, its length will change very little. Thus, we typically only consider shrinkage perpendicular to the wood's grain. But there are two directions that are perpendicular to grain, and these are the radial and tangential directions. The tangential direction, i.e. parallel to the growth rings, will exhibit much higher shrinkage uh, than the radial, in other words, perpendicular to the growth rings. So uh, let's just for a moment visualize what I'm talking about here. So if you have a piece of wood, a piece of lumber, well, let's go ahead and draw something. Well, that's not very good at all. We need something that's actually, oh, approximately round would be nice. And I'll kind of draw this almost as, I would, almost as I would draw like a pipe or something, but anyway. So we have a, a tree trunk, and this is going to have a series of growth rings. And then let's look at uh, shrinkage in relation to uh, the three axes that we mentioned. So uh, this is basically looking at, uh, if, you take a, if you take the trunk of a tree, uh, just saw it, you know, saw it right across the trunk, perpendicular to the trunk, and you see this kind of cross-section revealed with these kind of uh, growth rings revealed. Although most likely you're going to have much smaller growth rings uh, in relation to the overall diameter of the trunk, I'm just uh, showing a handful of them for simplicity's sake. So the first axis would be the longitudinal axis, and this axis here has negligible shrinkage. Now, I'm sure there's some small amount of shrinkage that occurs with uh, decreases in moisture content, um, but it is negligible. And if, if nothing else, it might occur from, say, you know, knots and burls and places where the grain is not perfectly in line with the uh, longitudinal axis of the tree. Um, but uh, it is still negligible. Uh, it's not something we generally need to worry about. Then we have the radial direction. And then we have the tangential direction. In other words, uh, parallel and perpendicular to the growth rings. So again, the tangential direction will exhibit much higher shrinkage than the radial. So you're going to get a uh, much higher shrinkage
Oh, let me actually write that properly. Properly-ish. And then lower shrinkage. So shrinkage is going to be maximum in, again, along the tangential direction. It's going to be lower, but still significant, depending on, well, of course, significance is a relative thing, but uh, still measurable, I should say, um, in the radial direction, and then it will be negligible along the actual grain or along the length of the trunk of a tree. So those are your three axes. And again, wood as an orthotropic material exhibits behaviors differently depending on what axis you're looking at. And so, um, and this will have implications for actually calculating shrinkage as we will discuss. So uh, let's say you need to calculate shrinkage of a piece of lumber used in construction. Maybe we want to install it now and we expect its moisture content will change over the seasons. Um, for example, maybe shrinkage or expansion related to this might potentially cause problems uh, with attachment to other elements or materials. So for example, let's say you had a house or something. Well, let's say you had a building um, and then maybe you have a sill plate like this. Let's say you have a sill plate like this, and then maybe you have your wall stud, and this would, this is not the scale, but this would go, you know, 10 feet up or something like that. Or it could be giving me a couple, maybe just a couple of feet if this is a crawl space. Yeah, let's go ahead and say that's only a couple of feet. So let's say you have a stud here, you have your sill plate, and then some distance over here, maybe you have a small concrete column. And you're using this, it helps if I draw things at the right height, but anyway, uh, let's say you have a, let's go ahead and just make this right, let's say I have something like this. And this is maybe a beam here. So let's say you have this sort of situation. Maybe you have a sill plate here. Um, so you have your sill plate, here's the ground, well, actually your foundation, but let's just say there's the ground here. They're supported by some foundation. So let's say you have a sill plate on this on the left side, a concrete column, uh, it's a very short, you know, stubby kind of concrete column, on the right side, and you have some sort of beam in between them. Um, so on one side it's being supported by a wood column, or I should say a wood stud, and a wooden sill plate, and on the right it's being supported by a small stubby concrete column. But think about this. As this expands and contracts, uh, it's this, this piece of wood, the sill plate, is going to expand and contract um, with changes in moisture content. Now, uh, the stud, since the grain is going to be running this way, it's not going to undergo substantial uh, changes in length with changes in moisture content. So, but the sill plate may or, or probably will undergo some changes in dimension because the grain here would be running into the page as shown. And so as the moisture, again, as the moisture content in the sill plate changes, this is going to expand and contract, thus causing the stud to rise and fall slightly Thus, thus causing this end of the beam to rise and fall slightly. And so what that's going to do is, uh, now if everything were rising and falling at the same rate, it wouldn't necessarily cause a problem, it likely wouldn't. But this concrete column being made of a different material is not going to undergo the same type of expansion and contraction with, uh, with changes in humidity, with changes in moisture content. And this is where you could potentially have di uh, difficulties. Um, it's just like, it's very analogous to the situation that you have with like foundations in expansive soils. Um, with, uh, you know, with buildings on expansive soils, the, the tricky issue, the more, the more, most critical case usually isn't just raw, uh, settling, it's differential settling. And that's the kind of thing that you might have here. So basically what might happen is that you could end up with a situation where the beam is now at a slight angle. Now I'm definitely exaggerating here. This would be, you know, a fraction of an inch, not, you know, a foot or something. But you can end up with one thing being shifted up or down that can then introduce uh, deformations and it can introduce stresses, might cause things like cracking of drywall, jamming of windows and doors, that sort of thing. It can cause various problems with your building. 
So uh, this is the kind of case where you might want to consider shrinkage. Uh, generally, you don't, I mean, shrinkage is not something that generally controls the design of wood structures, but this is the kind of situation where it might be important. So let's say we have a piece of wood, got a piece of lumber, and we could assume it's dimensional lumber, and I'm sure, I'm sure that's fine for now. Uh, so we just have a 2x4 or a 2x6 or whatever it might be. Um, and from a first principles mechanics point of view, this doesn't seem so bad. Sure, wood might have different properties in different directions, but that's not something that's impossible to deal with. I mean, why can't we just uh, look up some values for the tangential and radial shrinkage of the tree species used and perform some calcs? Uh, why would this be that hard? I mean, certainly people have been, I mean, I'm sure people have done lab tests um, on this. I mean, if people hadn't done lab tests on it, I wouldn't be talking about it and I wouldn't be telling you that, you know, shrinkage is uh, greater in one direction than another, because if the data's not there, how could I ever have come to that conclusion? So, I mean, at first, it, from a basic mechanics point of view, it doesn't seem that big of a deal. Like, well, yes, it's maybe a little bit of work, but why would this be so hard? At least from a, uh, from a basic mechanics point of view. Well, there are a few difficulties with this. Well, unfortunately, there are a few big issues with this. Again, while from a basic mechanics point of view, it shouldn't be that hard to calculate shrinkage, there are a few issues. So let's just go ahead and create a little list here. So problems with directly calculating shrinkage. And by this, I mean, you know, looking at a piece of lumber, uh, calculating its shrinkage, and depending on how you orient it, if we're, for example, if we're orienting that piece of lumber so the grain is pointing, uh, so it's, uh, so it is oriented, so the piece of lumber is oriented uh, parallel to the growth rings, then why can't we just use that value for shrinkage in that axis? At first, that seems relatively straightforward, but there's a few problems with that. One, variability. What do I mean by this? Um, so the first is variability. Just as strength of uh, individual wood members, even of the same species, can vary greatly due to growth patterns, local defects, etc., uh, shrinkage behavior can also vary substantially. Now, you'll be able to look up uh, shrinkage coefficients and values in uh, design tables and references and things, and in fact, we're going to actually look at some. But those values published are just averages. And the actual shrinkage experienced by any piece of lumber can vary substantially. Second, I want to talk about species. And in particular, species slash species groups. And for this, we're going to need to look at a different reference. So let's take a look at a different reference that we haven't considered before. Uh, this is the Wood Handbook. Wood is an engineering material. Uh, this is put out by the uh, U.S. Forest Service Forest Products Laboratory. Now, let's go to page 85. And we can see here a certain um, table that we're going to be looking at. And this is table 4.3, Shrinkage Values of Domestic Woods. Now, they also have other tables uh, and other statistics uh, for... Uh, things like imported woods that are common in the United States, but I just want to look at this one uh, here. So, uh, again, this is table 4.3, and on this PDF it's on page 85, and uh, this is uh, going to be in the description of the video below. I want to look at this table and then actually look at some of the values in question. So, uh, first of all, we can see uh, where we're getting the, the values for... Um, the idea that tangential uh, shrinkage is going to be greater than radial shrinkage, we can clearly see that for almost any type of wood we're going to find, the tangential shrinkage is going to be much higher than the uh, radial shrinkage. So for example, um, if we look at, oh, I don't know, um, if I look at maybe pine or something, pine, and it varies between types of pine, uh, eastern white pine here, the the value uh, of the given co the coefficient that they're giving us 
is, and we can, we could, we'll work with later how to actually, uh, you can actually go through this and look at uh, how you actually use these numbers, but um, they are proportional to how, what you would actually calculate. The uh, relevant figure for Eastern White Pine is 6.1 in the tangential direction and 2.1 in the radial direction. Again, this doesn't seem that difficult. I mean, why can't we just figure out how the piece of, if we have a piece of lumber that we're curious about the shrinkage behavior, why can't we just look up the radial and the tangential values and, uh, you know, just go and calculate the shrinkage? How hard could it be? Well, again, one of the first issue we talked about was variability, but a second issue is species, and in particular, species groups. So remember back to a previous video where we talked about species groups and uh, if you recall, we looked at a species group that's labeled DFL, and that's Douglas fir larch. And Douglas fir larch um, is a commercial species group that uh, many softwoods are very, uh, well, not, I shouldn't say many, but uh, several uh, uh, softwood species commonly used in construction in the Pacific Northwest are uh, labeled under. And so let's, let's, uh, let's look at this. We have Western Larch, and we have all the Douglas firs. Look at that. So in those, in that video, we talked about species groups, and what that means is, again, species groups are uh, tree species that, you know, they typically will resemble each other relatively closely in um, field conditions, so that uh, otherwise separating that would take some skill or difficulty work, etc. But they also have similar mechanical properties, or at least similar mechanical properties in terms of, um, in terms of your primary, you know, typically governing mechanical properties like tensile strength, bending capacity, shear, uh, modulus elasticity, that sort of thing. But let's take a look at these these uh, moisture related shrinkage coefficients. Look at this: um, Western larch and Douglas fir have substantially different shrinkage coefficients. Its tangential shrinkage has a value of 9.1, which our Western Larch has a tangential shrinkage of 9.1, which is substantially above any of the shrinkage values for the three variants of Douglas fir, whether you're dealing with coast, nor uh, interior north, or interior west. And then it's, uh, and then it's, um, uh, radial value is going to be uh, sort of in the middle range of where you might find uh, for uh, you know your Douglas fir. But here's the problem again. Remember that most common uh, if you if you go and buy lumber, you're not going to find unless it's a very tip unusual case. For most common construction quality lumber, you're going to find ever, all of the Douglas fir and all of the Western larch all grouped together in a single commercial group. It's not labeled Douglas fir coast, Douglas fir interior north, Douglas fir west, and uh, Western larch. Again, uh, I would, I, if you uh, haven't seen that video, I recommend going back and taking a look at it because it is very relevant this, to this discussion. You're not going to be able to t just go into say a lumber yard or a big box store, etc. You're not going to be able to tell exactly which species uh, you're buying. You'll know that it's it's going to be stamped DFL lumber, but you're not going to be able to know exactly which species you're buying. So if you're not if you if you don't have any way of knowing exactly which species you're buying, how in the world are you going to know which uh, which value to look at? Do you what what kind of uh, tangential shrinkage value should you use? Should you use seven point six? Should you use six point nine? Should you use seven point five? Should you use nine point one? How in the world do you handle this? This is the second of our great difficulties that we might have in, in calculating precisely a predicted shrinkage value for uh, a given piece of lumber. So again, you can see here we might have a problem. Again, remember back to our discussion of species groups. Douglas fir and Western larch have similar enough visual appearance and mechanical properties that they are sold as the same species group, the DFL commercial group. If I go purchase a piece of lumber with a DFL stamp on it, I again don't know whether I'm buying Douglas fir or Western larch. Now it might be possible for someone with a great deal of experience um, to tell them apart. You know, if you if a if you know sitting at a just looking at a pile of lumber, maybe a a really skilled carpenter, a really skilled arborist with a 
you know, a magnifying glass or something to tell them apart. But your typical construction worker, or I, for example, your typical engineer, construction worker, uh, contractor, etc., will not be able to tell them apart. So if I'm an engineer trying to calculate shrinkage, again, how am I supposed to actually calculate this? I guess, now, I suppose I could assume one, and then I could put a big warning and stamp on my drawings saying, Design assumes Douglas fir. Make sure to only use Douglas fir lumber and not Western large. And I could just stamp all of my drawings with that. And then, you know, if the contractor goes and uses uh, Western large uh, in their uh, construction, I suppose that's on them. I gave them their warning. I give them a warning. I put a label on my drawing saying, Only designed for Douglas fir. Do not use Western large. However, um, this has certain practical problems. If I do that, I'm not going to have much business as an engineer. Why? Because the contractor that bi that uh, builds that building is going to have to pay for a special order of wood. They can't just go down to the local lumber yard and buy regular old DFL lumber. They're going to have to file a custom order with the sawmill and have them go out and specifically identify whether the trees for my order are Douglas fir for or Western larch. Now, I suppose there's no reason an engineer couldn't um, put such a requirement on their drawings. I mean, I don't, I don't, uh, to my knowledge, there's nothing in professional or building codes that prohibit you from doing that. There might be some weird provision in something that I have, that I'm not familiar with. But, I'm so, so again, I suppose an engineer could, in theory, do that, but they wouldn't remain in business long for the, long if they did. Um, just as a hint, it's generally not a good idea to cause your clients exorbitant costs and a giant headache if you want to remain in business for long. Finally, there's a third issue we need to be aware of. And what that's going to be is grain direction. So uh, let's go ahead and uh, draw a basic oh, cross section of a tree trunk again. So um, think about how um, pieces of dimensional lumber or lumber in general are actually sawn from a tree trunk. Well, it's not like they're all uh, going to be cut from the, in going the same direction. Uh, so basically when a when a tree is milled, uh, what they do is they basically lumber yards try to get the max, or I shouldn't say lumber yards, sorry, I should say sawmills. Sawmills, understandably, try to get the maximum amount of uh, material they can from uh, from a given log. They want to, Their game is they want to get as many high quality uh, pieces of lumber as they can from a log um, with as minimum waste as possible. So what they'll do is they'll now in the olden days you would do this by hand. Um, but nowadays you'll often have uh, methods or sometimes uh, semi-automated or even fully automated ways of doing this. They'll have algorithms that run, you know, and maybe computer controlled saws in certain cases. They can get really fancy, you know, sawmill technology has gotten pretty fancy nowadays. But anyway, let's just, that's not uh, too important to our discussion, but think about this. Imagine taking a series of rectangular cross sections from a tree trunk, and remember, a sawmill is going to have um, is going to have trees coming in with all sorts of different grain directions, all sorts of different sizes, diameters, that sort of thing. So just go down to your local uh, big box store or lumber yard and look at the end grain, or just look at the ends of a uh, piece of uh, lumber, like a two by four or something. Just look at a just look at a big pile of two by fours and compare what you see. You're gonna find that those uh, two by fours, for example, have all sorts of different grain patterns on their ends. And the reason for that is that they are cut with all sorts of different orientations with relation to the um, grain of the wood. So, or I should say with relation to the uh, growth rings. So even if you a sawmill is only sawing uh, pieces of lumber or was only sawing trees that were all the same diameter for some insane reason, um, they would still, the actual end product, would still have all sorts of different orientations with relation to the grain. So again, what I mean by that is, look at this piece here, for example. This piece here, this given piece of lumber, is going to have, uh, is going to have the tangential direction um, largely uh, parallel to its long axis. Uh, let's say, um, 
this one here, this is going to have a, it's going to have the radial direction parallel to its uh, long axis uh, in terms of its cross section, the longer dimension of its cross section. And this one here is going to be somewhere in between. It's going to be almost at a 45 degree angle. And this one is just going to be a probably a really crappy piece of wood to use. But uh, <laughs> if you don't want it, well, I guess I'm being I'm showing my bias as a woodworker, not as a uh, not as a construction, uh, not con someone considering construction. Uh, if you're doing any kind of woodworking, you wouldn't want to use a piece of wood like that, although it will be perfectly fine for uh, construction purposes. It'll hold up low just fine, it'll just have a, a larger tendency to warp and cup and things like that. But anyway, that's going to have its own orientation, etc. So, again, the problem is, if you have a, um, if you have a big pile of 2 by 4s sitting in a lumber yard, if you look at the ends of it, you're going to find that the grain is pointed in all sorts of different directions. So, if you want to exactly calculate your, um, if you want to exactly calculate your, um, uh, your shrinkage for just for radial and tangential directions and then make certain assumptions in your calculation, you're going to also have to put on your, uh, also going to have to stamp on your drawings, uh, make sure to only use lumber of this, uh, certain grain orientation. And oh boy, if you uh, if you want, uh, let's just say you've just made some sawmill either really annoyed or really happy, possibly both, because they're gonna have a very expensive order to fill when your go when your uh, uh, owner or contractor goes to actually fill that order. That is going to be a royal pain in the butt. So we see again that we have three basic issues. And there will be others as well, but three major issues are one, the variability among actual uh, samples of wood. Second is the problem of tree species and species group that we as design engineers, uh, you know, when we're performing a design, creating a design for a building, we don't know the exact species. We typically don't know the exact species that's going to be used. We typically just know a species group. And that's fine for calculating things like bending and tensile capacity. But we, can't, but since the shrinkage values do vary substantially between species within a given species group, that's a problem. And finally, we see that we have all sorts of different unpredictable grain directions. And again, as a property that varies highly with grain direction, that's going to be an issue. So we can see that calculating shrinkage is actually very, very difficult to do with any kind of precision. As uh, designers, we generally don't know the exact species or grain direction a, a piece of lumber uh, we're designing for. And values for individual pieces of lumber can vary substantially uh, from the average values published in tables like these. So if we have to calculate shrinkage then, how in the world do we handle it? So with that in mind, if we do have to actually calculate shrinkage for some reason, as we've mentioned previously, there are some cases where it may be important. And um, a paper referenced by Rummelhart and Fantosi is referenced in the Brayer wood design text. Uh, Brayer outlines the method they developed, and I'll illustrate this method here. Uh, the Rummelhart Fantosi method um, uses a simplified shrinkage approach based on three key assumptions. Um, first, they assume that zero shrinkage will occur at an assumed uh, fiber saturation point of a moisture content of 30%. Uh, two, a shrinkage of 6% will occur at a moisture content of 0%, and this is assumed regardless of species and grain direction. And three, uh, shrinkage will be linear between them. So these three key assumptions, if you do make these assumptions, all of a sudden, all of the difficulties uh, that we previously discussed um, are approximated away. Again, it's not going to be 100% perfect, but it is a it does produce a practical method that design engineers can use to ac actually calculate um, shrinkage. Now, while this is certainly not perfect, we've seen that there's no perfectly precise way of doing this in a practical manner. Uh, rather, uh, or instead, Normal Hart and Fantosi recommended this method as being adequate for most contexts. Basically, they um, Went, th went through and studied a series of real-world structures and determined that these kind of assumptions would be adequate for most cases. There may be some um, weird edge cases, but typically um, these will be appropriate. So let's go back to this table, uh, table 4.3 in the uh, wood manual. So if you look here, if we assume a shrinkage value of 6%, 
we can see that that's actually a decent average value. If you look at, say, large here, six is right about near the, well, actually it's more toward the left, I suppose, but looking across all of these species that are commonly used in construction, softwood species commonly used in construction, a 6% uh, assumed shrinkage is not that bad. That's probably a good average value for all of those. If you average across all species, across uh, grain directions, uh, the tangential and radial grain direction, etc. So that's not too bad for an average assumed value. And we will go and look at some, uh, some examples uh, after this. And generally, this is the method I would uh, recommend. Shrinkage again usually isn't a huge concern for most wood frame construction, but for cases where it is, the 6% assumed uh, value is conservative in most instances. Alternatively, I guess if you are really paranoid about damage from shrinkage, you could be extra conservative. What you could do is you could just pick the highest shrinkage value for any species or direction in the group that you'll be using, and then perhaps add 20% uh, in case the pieces you end up getting uh, exhibit abnormally high shrinkage. Now, that would likely be a huge overkill though, and might cause further problems in itself. So, um, I'm next going to work through a couple of examples of shrinkage problems, but I'll be using this uh, assumed 6% uh, shrinkage value, uh, and also the 30% and 0% N values, uh, as outlined by Romelhart and Fantosi. So, consider this problem here. A 2x4 is used as a sill plate, um, is used as a sill plate, calculate the maximum change in width and height it might undergo. So think back to the assumptions that we're going to use. The assumptions um, from the Remmel Hart and Fantosi method, again, what we're going to do is assume 6% shrinkage uh, between a moisture content of 30% and a moisture content of 0%. So for the maximum shrinkage, we would be going from a moisture content of 30 to a moisture content of 0. Okay, and if you're not familiar with this program, this program is SMATH. Um, I do have a, a series on this channel uh, looking at how to uh, handle SMATH, some basic instruction in it, um, and go ahead and take a look at that if you're curious. SMATH is just kind of a WYSIWYG, what you see is what you get, um, what you see is what you get a uh, hand calculation generator or calculation sheet program, very similar to um, MathCAD, except it's really nice and that is a freeware program. Okay, so I'm just gonna go ahead and define some variables. So I think first I'll just, I'll just call uh, uh, maybe a shrinkage coefficient. And this would be, I'm just gonna go ahead and call this arbitrarily S. And I'll just call that, uh, label that as 0 0.06 for the 6%. Then maybe I'll calculate the change in, oh, also I need my uh, initial and final heights. So let's do an, an uh, end with course. I can manage to spell the word initial properly. Uh, the initial height, and I'm gonna call this HI. And that's gonna be equal to 1.5 inches, just the, Although usually we label this, uh, the, one, the narrow dimension is the width and the broader one is the height, but that's assuming we're using that as a bending element, but this is a sill plate, so it's going to be uh, laid flat on the ground, or actually not on the ground, on the foundation. Um, but so that's why I'm using uh, these as the width and the height. And of course the 1.5 and 3.5 come from the fact that this is a two by four. And the initial width, this would be 3.5 inches. Uh, next, let's go ahead and calculate some delta values, some change. And this would simply be the product of the two. So the change, uh, I'm going to call this, since we're doing a change, I'll be fancy and go ahead and put in a delta in there. That's just going to be hi times our coefficient s. And it wants to output in meters, but since we're doing everything in inches. We'll go ahead and output that in inches. So this thing is going to undergo a change in height along this axis here of uh, 0.21 inches. And then I'll copy that and change some labels and variables to get a change in width as well. 
and I'll go ahead and call that change in delta B instead of delta H, and label that BI um, as well. Oops, looks like I need to rename that. Oh, and that's, I was wondering why that value was so high. Sorry, the change in height is going to be 0.09 inches. So in other words, it's going to change 0.09 uh, inches in this direction and 0.21 inches in this direction. And again, this is the maximum amount of shrinkage that might occur. And so I could then say the minimum height, uh, this would be simply the subtraction of the two or the difference of the two. And that would be HI, oh, HI minus delta H. And I'll go ahead and label that in inches. And then the minimum width as well. Oh, I actually should probably just go ahead and give this a label. That would be good as well. So copy this, put this, and give this a label of HF and define HF as the, just the difference that I just outlined. And that will equal that in meters, but I want to get this in inches. 1.41 inches. And we'll go ahead and calculate that, or change that, uh, copy and paste this and change it into a width, and relabel some values, just put, replacing my B, H's with B's. B and B. So, um, assuming this undergoes the maximum amount of shrinkage we're going to assume, um, the minute and assuming the height, the height and width are based on the, at the fiber saturation point, which is not an unreasonable assumption, the minimum height that that two by four as oriented this way, the, the minimum height of that sill plate might be 1.41 inches and the minimum width might be 3.29 inches. And again, that is assuming the worst case of shrinkage going from all the way from the 30% moisture content to a 0% uh, moisture content. So uh, next, let's look at this problem here. Calculate the shrinkage the same 2x4 sill plate will undergo from a moisture content of 18% to a moisture content of 10%. And so this is going to be a little bit different and intrinsically a little more difficult, although still not too bad as we'll see. Um, so the difficulty with this is that we're not going to experience the whole 30% uh, shrinkage value, or I should sorry, the, thir the full 6% uh, shrinkage value going from moisture content of 30% to a moisture content of 0%. Um, uh, we're only going from the 18 to 10. So what that might mean is let's say uh, as you, when you install a piece of lumber, maybe it has a moisture content of 18%, and you know that in your area, the moisture content of, you know, interior lumber, properly, uh, you know, properly uh, shielded lumber uh, will have uh, maybe a minimum moisture content of 10%. So you're expecting over the seasons, maybe it, its moisture content will vary from 18 to 10%, and you want to know the shrinkage about both axes, both width and height, um, that will occur over that moisture content, just over that moisture content range. So what I'm going to first do is I'm going to calculate a uh, shrinkage value. And what I mean by that is basically the uh, percent shrinkage for 1% change in moisture content. And that's going to be relatively straightforward. So again, because the um, because the uh, overall change in, in um, shrinkage is, or the overall yeah the overall shrinkage is six percent from um, from thirty uh, to zero, I want to calculate that for just one for just one percent change in moisture content. So that's just going to be equal to um, six over thirty. Um, per 1% change in the moisture content, or more precisely, if I want a coefficient I can use, I should use the same 0.06 uh, that I used above, and then I'll have a number that I can just directly multiply, and that's going to be 0 0.002. In other words, um, for every 1% change in moisture content, the, um, the dimensions are going to decrease by a factor of 0 
So uh, let's go then go ahead and calculate the um, shrinkage, or in, it, in other words, the change in height. Uh, the shrinkage or the change in height. And actually, let's go ahead and also calculate, just go ahead and put down a delta MC, a change in moisture content. Or maybe I'll even put in a moisture content initial. We'll get fancy here and have an initial and a final uh, explicitly labeled. So the moisture content initial would be, um, let's say, MC dot... I equals, that would be 18% in this problem. And the moisture content final would be uh, the 10%. Would be 10%. And then we'll go ahead and calculate an overall change in moisture content, which of course, I could just, you know, subtract them in my head. That's obviously 18 minus 10 is 8. But I'm just uh, creating, the, if I'm creating an SMAS sheet, I'll just go ahead and make it more complete for the sake of uh, thoroughness. I should say uh, change in moisture content. And that would be a delta MC. And that would be MC initial minus... MC final. Actually, no, that would be the other way around. We usually do delta as final minus initial. And so that would be a negative 8. Now, um, we'll probably want to work... The, now, having this as a negative um, is a little bit weird because... Um, that is going to introduce the issue that we're going to have to put a negative in our actual shrinkage calculation because the shrinkage assumes a positive value for a change in moisture content, but that's fine. That way we can do the nice proper final minus initial for our delta. And all the mathematicians in the audience, well, I probably shouldn't say mathematicians, I should probably say high school mathematics teachers will be very, uh, very pleased with that. Anyway, got that pounded into my head in high school. Anyway, um, so uh, let's calculate the, now I think we can calculate the shrinkage but let's call this height shrinkage, which is just the change in height. And that would be equal to the uh, height initial, the initial height. We'll actually just call that um, S comma H, the shrinkage in height. And we can call these whatever you want. These variables, of course, are just, these labels, of course, are arbitrary. The shrinkage in height uh, that's going to be equal to the initial height times our shrinkage value times our change in moisture content, our delta MC. And, oh, actually, we do need that negative. Well, actually, I suppose we could leave it as neg a, a, a negative value, but I guess to be consistent with what we have above, I will go ahead and just put a negative in there. And then that produces something it wants to output in meters, but I'm gonna I'm gonna tell it to output in inches. So it's going to have a change in height of 0.024 inches, which we notice is substantially less than what we had before, which was sort of the maximum case. We're only undergoing a portion of that um, change in moisture content, so then we're only gonna have a portion of that change in dimension, or a portion of that resulting shrinkage. So then the uh, width shrinkage, again, the change in width. And I'll go ahead and, and just go, uh, go ahead and change my variables here. And things will go relatively uh, quickly. And that's going to be 0 0.056 inches. And so uh, then I could say my... Um, I could go and calculate my final initial height, but actually, yeah, go, let's go ahead and assume the initial height was the same 1.5. Let's say, uh, actually, the nice thing about this, I can probably just go ahead and copy these and change them to a, uh, just modify the variables. 
and call these final height and final width. And that would be all, all I need to do is change this to be co to be uh, uh, compatible with my earlier uh, my previous calculation. And s comma b. And there we have it. The final height would be 1.476 or 1.48 inches, and the final width would be 3.44 inches. And that's how you handle. Um, that's how you apply this uh, Rommel Hart and Fantosi method for a portion of the shrinkage range rather than the entire thing, than, rather than the entire uh, shrinkage range from a moisture content of 30% to a moisture content of 0%. Finally, let's consider this example here. A wall is constructed with a 2x4 uh, double top plate, a 2x4 sill plate, and an 8 foot long and, and 8 foot long 2x4 studs. Uh, calculate the change uh, of the overall change of height in the wall going from a moisture content of 8% to a moisture content of 12%. In other words, uh, we want to know the overall, the entire change of height uh, from all of the slumber going from, from the entire wall, all the lumber in it, going from a moisture content of 8% to 12%. So I'm gonna go ahead and copy a few things over here. That will be the same. Let's see, this S value, again, we're just using the Rommel Hart and Fantosi method and assuming the same 6% from zero to 30. Now our initial moisture content here is going to be, uh, let's say this is going to be 12%, or sorry, 8%, and this is going to be uh, 12%. And then our change in moisture content is going to be that and then the height shrinkage well we got to be very careful this is going to be the uh height shrinkage of just one two by four um like from here to here basically so this is going to be oh and we also need an initial height but thankfully that's going to be exactly the same because we're still using two by fours Initial height, so that's gonna be the same, 1.5 inches. Okay, so um, since we now have a different change in moisture content, we're going to experience a negative height shrinkage. Oh, that's interesting. And that's because, again, this is actually, because it's going from a lower moisture content to higher moisture content, it's actually going to expand, or in other words, a negative shrinkage. And so the height shrinkage is going to be negative 0.02, 0.012, inches or in other words i could say I, I, should, I should probably i should or i should probably label this height shrinkage of one uh height shrinkage of one silk plate slash top plate um then what i next need to wonder worry about is what about the shrinkage of the studs So uh, this is obviously not to scale, because this is going to be just 1.5 inches from here to here, 3 inches from here to here, so obviously that's not to scale. Um, and this entire thing here is, is much larger at 8 feet. So um, do we need to worry about how do we handle that shrinkage? Well, um, remember, uh, we've pre as we previously discussed, we don't need to consider shrinkage uh, in the longitudinal direction. The grain in these studs is going to be going up and down here while uh, in the uh, sill and top plates they're going into the page so while these things may expand while this uh, uh, wall stud or these wall studs will expand left and right and into and out of the page they will not expand vertically and thus contribute to the overall change in height so this is actually just going to be zero I'm not even going to include it in my calculation so the overall change in height Um, is going to just be, and since this is a, I'll go ahead and put a negative shrinkage value on this. Uh, let's say delta H, and since we have three of these elements, one, two, three, it's going to be, oh, I'll put a negative on here, negative three times our 
uh, shrinkage value. And so that's just going to be 0.036 inches. And so the final wall height, oh, actually I should probably go calculate the overall initial wall height. And that would be, I'm gonna use a capital H for this to, symbol, to signify that I'm talking about the overall height, not just the height of the sill and top plate. And that would be eight feet plus three times our HI value. And that would be, that would come to 100.5 inches. And then the overall final wall height would just be, uh, let's see, that's going to be the final height is going to be equal to the initial wall height, the initial overall height, plus our delta H. And actually, I should probably call that delta capital H to be consistent in my labels. But uh, maybe a pedant maybe I'm being a bit pedantic with that. Delta H, delta H, and that is 100.536 inches. So we're looking at, you know, well less than a tenth of an inch of shrinkage. Um, let's, um, so yeah, let's, you know, one over 16th by comparison is 0.0625. So we're looking, and one over 32nd is 0.03125. So we're looking over this entire wall, we're looking at about one thirty-second of an inch of shrinkage, and that may or may not be important. Typically, that's not important. Again, in most cases, we don't need to consider shrinkage, but especially if you have large changes in moisture content, or if you have very tall multi-story buildings, imagine if you had a 10-story wooden building and you had many, many double, you know, sill plates and top plates and things like that. Um, in that case, in, in those cases, if you get, you start adding more and more and more of these uh, horizontal elements, in some cases, you know, if you, if you have a dozen of them and you're multiplying by a dozen instead of three, um, you might start getting substantial shrinkage, especially if you also have large changes in moisture content. But anyway, again, in most cases, we don't need to consider it as design engineers, but there may be some cases where it is important. And with that, we'll wrap up for now. As we've seen, shrinkage occurs in wood as part of the seasoning process. Still, calculating shrinkage can be very difficult and has many complications with it. We explored the Rummelhart Fantosi simplified method as one option for considering shrinkage in a practical design calculations. Uh, finally, we considered some example problems to see how this can be applied. Uh, hopefully you found this lecture helpful and perhaps a little interesting. If you did, please like, comment, and subscribe to make the YouTube robots happy. Uh, if you'd like to help make content like this possible, um, please see the link to our Patreon page in the channel description. Uh, channel patrons not only help support the show, but also get access to materials such as video slides, scripts, and calculation sheets. The S-Math sheets used for this lecture are found on there and accessible to channel patrons. Regardless, I hope you found this video useful and informative. The next video is going to be a series of examples illustrating where to find uh, reference design values for certain properties in the NDS. And then after that, we will move on to exploring individual modification factors. I hope, you, I hope to see you all then and for later lectures, and I'll be back again soon. Hope to, I look forward to seeing you all then, and as always, thank you.